Signore e signori, buonasera. Welcome to New York University Casa Italiana, Zerili Marimo. With the little voice I have, I just would like to uh, thank all of you for being present, and in particular, Jackie Wright, for having accepted the invitation to present her new book on Machiste uh, here at the Casa. I have to say that as, as a young boy growing up in Italy, uh, Machiste was one of the recurrent nightmares of my Sunday afternoons when, after uh, the, the benediction with the Blessed Sacrament, we had access to the Cinema dell'Oratorio, the, the parochial uh, movie theater, where there was a very, very limited program of films uh, that were approved for the kind of audience that was made up of normally young boys um, with high testosterone and a lot of censorship. So machista films were among the few that were allowed uh, in this program, along with the song of Bernadette and uh, Marcellino uh, Panevino, that I don't know the title. So periodically these figure uh, came out in, in, in the films. And uh, when I first uh, heard from Jackie herself that she was uh, working on machista, I was fascinated by the fact that a brilliant cutting edge scholar like her was interested in in, uh, in uh, this character that is really a, a seed in in uh, Italian cinematographic culture and emblematic for many reasons that they're going to explore in the discussion that they're going to have after the screening of the film. So tonight, um, my colleague Professor David Forga, she's going to introduce Jackie. Um, they're going to say a few words about the film before the screening. Then we are going to see the film that lasts about an hour and 10 minutes, if I remember correctly. And then we're going to have a discussion with uh, the author of the book that is also for sale upstairs. And I remind you, you can buy a copy, and Jackie will sign it for you if you want. And, uh, um, and the, the discussion that will follow the screening immediately after. It's a great pleasure to um, invite to the stage to introduce Professor Reich, David Forgas, who is the holder of the Guido Mario Cesarini Marimo Chair in Contemporary Italian Studies here at New York University. Uh, Professor Forgas has studied both at Oxford University and got his PhD at the Scuola Normale Superiore di Pisa in philosophy. Uh, his latest book is Italy's Margins, Social Exclusion and National Formation since 1861 published both in Italian uh, and in English. And he has also he has extensive publications, including the Antonio Gramsci Reader, Mass Culture and Italian Society from Fascism to the Cold War. And regarding cinema, he wrote um, a very important book about Roberto Rossellini, Roberto Rossellini, Magician of the Real, and uh, a, a, a monography, a special book on Rome, Open City. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce also David as the next chair of the Department of Italian Studies and to congratulate him, the Dean just informed us of, of his decision. And so I invite him to take the stage and I wish him all the best uh, also in his new capacity at New York University. Thank you, David. Thanks, Stefano, for that nice introduction. Although, of course, this is not about me, it's about Jackie Reich and her book and, and the Machista film. So I, I'm gonna, gonna take a back seat, I think. and ask us some questions afterwards. I just want to clarify that we are having a screening of the film, but we also want to have a discussion of this important book. And, and it's not just the film screening and a discussion of the movie. In some ways, I think the idea is to show a machiste movie, the, the first machiste movie after Kabiria, uh, so 1915, right? Um, to just show you what a machiste movie looks like, to get you into understanding this character and, and these, these films. But we then want, I think, to enlarge the discussion to talking about the whole series of machiste films, the ones that have been restored recently by the Museo del Cinema of Torino, uh, to which this restoration project uh, is tied to Jackie's book. Um, so it's really all about that 
book, this film, and about Jackie, who I must say, I mean, I've known Jackie since the early 90s when she was a graduate student at Berkeley and I was a professor in Cambridge, and that's because I'm old and she's young. And, and you know, since then, she's kind of come to full professor position. She's published a lot. She's done fantastic work. I mean, she's made a major contribution to uh, Italian film studies, or I would say Italian cinema studies, perhaps, because there's a difference between film studies and cinema studies. Film studies, you look at films as texts. Cinema studies, you look at the whole world around a film. And the work that Jackie does uh, is studies of stardom. Uh, a lot of it has been studies of male movie stars and masculinity in Italian cinema. I think I'm right to say that's the, really the running thread in, thread in her research. So she published in, uh, in 2004 her first major book, which was called Beyond the Latin Lover, Marcello Mastroianni, Masculinity and Italian Cinema. I mean, if I can summarize the argument in a nutshell, <laughs> which Jackie may not agree with, it's, it's that Mastroianni embodies a particular crisis of masculinity in post-war Italy. Mas the Mastroianni is a, a kind of figure of what the Italians call linetto, the kind of, a bit like the schlemiel in sort of Jewish, Yiddish culture. He's somebody who is kind of um, ineffective, he can't, he can't hold relationships together, he's, you know, so he's against the kind of stereotype of, 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 of Latin Italian masculinity. Why does that figure emerge in the early post-war period? Why is he so charismatic and so important? And that book kind of gives the answers, and it's a brilliant piece of original research. Uh, and then she went on to produce this next major monograph on the Machiste films, but she's published other things as well. She collect a collection of essays called Reviewing Fascism, Italian Cinema, 1922-1942, which I have an essay in, <laughs> but it's a good collection even with the other essays, um, which came out in 2002, uh, which was a major kind of, I think when it came out, not a lot of good work was being done on the cinema of the fascist period. People really didn't know those films very well. People thought they knew them and they had stereotypical descriptions of them. They were all either propaganda films or escapist films. They either had to be you know, promoting the regime's arguments or they had to be escapist films. And this was one of the first books that really cut through the inadequacy of that stereotype and actually looked at the films carefully and also looked at the world around the films, star culture, um, the production um, and distribution businesses, uh, audiences. Uh, it was a really a breakthrough book. It's hard to believe it came out that long ago now, but it, it's still a, you know, a kind of major reference point in the field. We'll talk about the Machiste book, which came out uh, last year, very recently, published by Indiana. Um, and uh, and Jackie's also produced another book in 2015, uh, is that right? Came out last year as well, uh, which she co-wrote with Catherine O'Rourke, uh, which is in, in Italian, and it's called Divi, La Mascolinità nel Cinema Italiano, published by Donzelli. Um, and that, you know, between the two of them, these two authors track the whole kind of history of male movie stars from Bartolomeo Pagano, from Machiste to Ricardo Scamaccio, you know, from 1914 to the present. Uh, and they look at audiences and why, or how audiences uh, sort of feed star cults. They look at all that world around movie stars. So I, I, what excites me about the work that Jackie's done really over the last 20 years um, and is still producing is that she's really opened up this whole path of looking at male movie stars. But beyond that, in, into kind of masculinity and reconfigurations of masculinity in, in Italy, right? It's, much, it's a much wider project because once you start looking outside films, into the relationship between films and society and films and audiences, you're looking at a kind of cultural history of the whole of the society. So we'll, we'll look at this film now, Jackie will introduce it, and then we'll have a discussion of the film, um, the book, and this wider project on stars. Okay, so Jackie. <laughs> Thank you for that incredibly lovely introduction. I'm, I'm blushing. Um, and uh, I just want to very briefly contextualize the film because it's an important reference. So Machiste actually was born not in this film, but in a film called Cabiria, um, which uh, David referenced from 1914. And that is the most uh, popular and well-known uh, Italian silent film. And it takes place in third century BC in Carthage. And uh, it's the story of a young girl named Cabiria who's kidnapped and then subsequently rescued by um, uh, uh, this Roman, uh, Fulvia Axila, and his slave, his African slave, Machiste. 
Um, the film was incredibly popular in Italy and abroad, had a huge success, very considered a foundational piece of um, Italian cinema, of silent cinema in general. And uh, Machiste emerged from it as this incredibly popular character. Here was this muscled slave um, who was someone who uh, was very strong and powerful, but at the same time had this kind of heart of gold. He was known as Il Gigante Buono, or the Gentle Giant. So this guy was enormously popular. The actor Bartolomeo Pagano, who played him, was an unknown. He had been discovered um, while working at the Genovese ports. That's actually true. It's not a myth. Uh, and yeah, we, we researched all of this stuff. Um, and uh, he became an enormous star. So the, uh, Giovanni Pastrone, who was the director of Cabiria and the creative director behind Itala film, you know, thought, well, okay, let's produce a series or let's make a film about machiste, but had one real problem. The problem was in the, uh, in the original film in Cabiria, he's black, he's an African slave. So how are you going to have a very popular character of a series, a standalone series in 1915 be an African slave? Well, they have a very interesting device which opens up the whole uh, film, uh, which is one of the first scenes, in which it is now set in contemporary Turin. A couple of things to look for when you watch this film. The opening scene, or one of the opening scenes when you actually get to the Itala film studio, because it sort of neatly explains Machiste's transformation uh, from slave to, shall, uh, th to uh, white uh, member of the bourgeoisie, um, is that it's actually filmed at the actual Itala studio um, in 1915 in Turin. So it's a wonderful example of a contemporary studio made during the silent period that was making films during the silent period. The other thing to pay attention to in the film is sort of the combination between irony and humor and action. Machista's character is quite funny. Um, and he's one of the few uh, sort of figures like this. He's a very unique figure in his, uh, in his, the way he combines strength and humor. Uh, and lastly, look at the role of costume. Costume is extremely important in this film and the role that it plays. But mostly, uh, the reason why I gave you this contextualization is there's actually a very important reference to Cabiria right in the beginning of the film. So um, I don't want to you know, spoil anything else for you. So without further ado, uh, let's watch the film. Well, I think that gives you a pretty good idea of what these films are all about and also their extraordinary appeal. Um, Jackie, can you just remind us how many machiste films then went they went on to make in the series? Oh gosh, I can never remember the exact number, but it was, was this one? No. Uh, it was around 20. Yeah. Um, they made 20. Um, not all of them are, are, avail are, are available for viewing. No. Many of them have been lost. And you've restored, sorry, or the Museo del Cinema people <laughs> restored 10, is that right? Um, they had restored the uh, nine Itala films. Right. And it was a combination of the National Film Museum and the Cineteca di Bologna. Right. So it was a, it was a joint project right. with... the Cine uh, Ritrovato. With the, right, with the uh, Limagine Ritrovato in Bologna. Yeah, yeah right. Um, and I mean, I think we should, can we name the people? There were two women who particularly who worked on this project. Uh, yeah, I, 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 first of all, I want to thank the museum for allowing us to screen uh, the film because yeah. the, this is their beautiful restoration, which I hope you enjoyed. Uh, the, um, uh, I, basically what happened was in about 2007, I started working on this project and I remember telling you about that yeah, I was going to work on this project and you're, you're like, well, finally someone's going to do it. And I went to the National Film Museum and I uh, went to the Cineteca there to look at the films and I met uh, the woman who's the head archivist, her name is uh, Claudia Gianetto and a woman who worked there, Stella Dania, and we started talking about these films and um, uh, we and so they were in the process of restoring them. They had done, I think, about six at that point, and they had programmed to do many more. And uh, I saw this great opportunity for us to kind of enter into a dialogue um, about 
on the one hand, those of us who are film historians and who look at a kind of cultural patrimony of these films and the people who do the restoration. And very, very few, um, sort of the very, you kind of have the film who do the, the restoration people and the scholars separated from each other. So we sort of thought about, well, why not somehow combine our project? So uh, what, we, what I did was while I was writing uh, the book, uh, they were writing the appendix, and they contributed a beautiful appendix to the book, which details the restoration of the films, provides a, cre a complete filmography of all of the Machiste films, and also has an in-focus section where they take scenes that I discuss in the film, in the book, and analyze them from the restoration point of view. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were just in, I was just in Turin a couple, a week and a half ago, presenting the book there at the National Film Museum, and that was great. And uh, we're hoping to release an Italian translation of it as well. Yeah. I mean, I think I, one the striking thing about all these films, at least the ones I've seen in the series, is how well they use landscapes. It's uh, not just in this. There's a lot of exterior shots, you know, when they're driving and when there's the raid on the car, but also buildings, trees in the distance. Uh, and I think uh, Machista Alpino, which was made the year after this, is that right? During yes. the First World War, he plays a soldier in this crack regiment of the Alpini. <laughs> it's got some fantastic shots in, in the Alps, shot in the snow, uh, where he does these feats you know, with the other soldiers. So that seems to be, it's very striking in, in the films how much they use Italian landscape. I, I, don't, I think it's intentional because in many ways um, what Machiste became was a sort of national symbol. And at a time when Italy was sort of searching for itself and searching for identity and it would often search for its identity through landscape. And the, uh, so the country and the land plays a very important part in the kind of formation of character and in the relationship between film, nationalism, and the male body, yeah. um, in particular the muscles. Like Machi in Machiste Alpino, the Al Machiste the Alpine soldier, the one that you cite, he, um, he's often very sort of muscular in his, uh, in his Alpine uniform with a very large feather. He has an extra large feather because he's extra large. And and, uh, and he's always shot against the majestic landscape. So there's an association of the sort of majestic Alps with Machiste's own majesty and the majesty and the power of his muscles. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm glad we're going in this direction of the nation because one of the important arguments in your book is that Machiste is um, what's going on in these Machiste films. So from 1915 till, when's the last one in the series? Uh, 26. 26. You know, that's the decade from when Italy joins the First World War, 1915, to, you know, four years into the fascist government. Um, so Mussolini comes to power in 1922. And I think one of the things you try and look at is the way that the Machiste films parallel what's going on in Italy, mm -hmm. and in some ways present a, a, a kind of masculine, hero figure who embodies something about national identity or a kind of rediscovery of a national identity. It's a very interesting thesis. I wonder if you could just elaborate it a bit. Well, uh, in terms of uh, one of the things, one of the sort of ways that I came to the project also was through Mussolini, right? And there had been a lot of parallels between Machiste and Mussolini. And I sort of wanted to unpack that. And I wanted to look at, well, how are these two figures related? Um, did Mussolini kind of copy Machiste in a lot of his poses? And, you know, I didn't find like the smoking gun, you know, the, the notebook with like I heart Machiste all over it in <laughs> Mussolini's possession. I wish I had. Um, but I did find a lot of very convincing circumstantial evidence that uh, Mussolini sort of drew on Machiste's image for his own sort of projection of a kind of national virility. Mm. Uh, but in terms of some of the other kind of events, because what happens is Machiste Alpino, or Machiste gets caught up in all kinds of historical events. So it's World War I, um, the strikes in Turin in 1919 in Machiste Namorato, questions of sovereignty in the trilogy, mm. uh, and then colonialism in, what's, in Machiste in the lion's den. Um, he goes uh, Orientalism in Machiste against the Sheik. Yes, there is Machiste against the Sheik. Uh, and so there are all of these kinds of parallels that you see him engaging with kind of contemporary ideals and contemporary events. Mm. So he kind of does become the national symbol. Um, what's also really fascinating in the films um, before the fascist period, right during the sort of troubled period between 19 um, and 20 in liberal Italy, 
uh, you see him kind of setting this very sort of uh, wonderful, masculine, strong, and gentle ideal at a time of great turmoil in Italy, particularly after the destruction of World War I, and where you had a lot of men coming home with kind of mangled bodies, right? They were the war wounded. And here was this very contrasting, strong figure who provided a kind of unifying element. And his films were incredibly popular. I think that's one of the things you could say, well, how do you know all this? Well, his films were huge hugely popular. Machiste was paid, or excuse me, Pagano was paid probably something time like 800 times more than his nearest contemporary uh, in terms of his salary. Uh, the 1926 films, he made three of them in 1926, were incredibly, they were the only films practically made in Italy at the time. Yeah, and I think what's very striking, and, it, and you can see in that film how how powerful it is. I mean, you can understand why they're popular. You you know, you're with the guy <laughs> all the way through. You know, you're going to rescue the girl. You're going to rescue the mother. You're going to get the bad duke arrested, um, and on the way, you're going to have these spectacular fights where he just throws people all over the place. I mean, it's just <laughs> wonderful. In Machista Alpino, I remember at the end of the scene of that, too, the Austrian troops have uh, surrounded a house. There's a, a woman tied up, so it's right. a very parallel story. There's always the threatened girl motif. She's about to be attacked by raped actually by these two men, and Machista kind of unties her rescues her and brings her, reunites her with her husband, is it, or partner, right, who's yeah. a soldier. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, and he's got this wonderful grin on his face as he does it. He's kind of tossing these Austrians out the window. You know, so it's kind of like a kung fu movie or a sword movie or a, you know, it, it, or a Popeye in a way. It's got that same kind of comic excess of the fight. And, and people want to go and see that again and again. You yeah, and he is very, very funny. You know, this he's a really unique figure in 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 film history at the time because he's both very um, he's both very you know sort of this heroic strong man, and this was a whole topos in the historical epics that Italy continued. Um, but he's also quite funny. He has he's humorous. He's he's fun to watch. So, and it, there was a lot made about how this was sort of family fair, right? You could take your kids to see this, as opposed to some of the more lascivious entertainment that was going on at the time. I should also note that Machista was very popular in the United States. Um, this film came over, and then Machista Alpino came over. This one was called Marvelous Machista, and Machista Alpino was called the warrior, and he kind of became this wartime symbol of the alliance between the US and Italy. Uh, and his films were just marvelously uh, well received and shown from coast to coast. Mm. One of the, if we can come back to the, the parallel with Mussolini, um, it just so happens in the course I'm teaching at the moment, we're looking at the um, reception of Mussolini in the United States in the 1920s, when, as you probably well know, he was very popular. Right. Um, or was not with the labor movement, but certainly with you know, a lot of um, elite opinion, conservative opinion, but liberal opinion as well. So a lot of leader writers for the major newspapers thought this guy was a good thing. Not so much fascism, but the figure of Mussolini himself, and they admired his strength. He was strong, he'd stabilized the country, he'd tamed the unions, he'd done all these things. And you know, the, the, you can see there are a kind of number of parallels really coming out, particularly in the 20s. Mussolini liked to have himself photographed stripped to the waist when he did the you know, threshing. Uh, he has, as he started going bald, he shaved his head to make himself look more masculine and young and phallic, you, know, you might say. So e even in the physique and the physical self-presentation, there seem to be a lot of parallels. It's not, you know, you're not the first person to have said this, but, but it, it is very, very striking how their careers do seem to run in parallel. And they were both actually very nappy dressers as well. Machiste, you know, he's always got, do you notice he always has his suit, right? Remember when he has, goes out the window, he throws his jacket and his hat, <laughs> right? Uh, God forbid he should lose his hat, the right? The double-breasted suit and, and the double-breasted suit and the spats, right? Yeah. And, and Mussolini also was a very, um, you know, very interested in fashion and he recognized the projection of clothes. So if you look at the early newsreels featuring Mussolini from, um, like the early 20s, right, right when he comes to power, he is very rarely in a military uniform. He is very rarely in a black shirt. He is mostly seen in suits and jackets um, and or, you know, stripped to the waist down, although it comes a little bit later, but doing athletic feats on a horseback. He's often on horseback. Machiste often appears on horseback in his films. Uh, um, but he is a man of the people always presented as a man of the people, just like um, uh, just like Machiste. There's another great film, gosh, I can't believe I forgot this one, Machiste the Emperor, 
um, in which he is basically restore. He basically takes the place of um, a, a deposed prince in order to restore rightful rule, and he calms and placates the masses. He's the good leader, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a very important transitional text. And at one point, you even see, see him kind of doing the Roman salute. Uh, in one of them. So there's a lot of parallels, um, not just the athleticism, but also the poses, right? Machiste was often photographed with his hands on his hips or crossing his uh, arms. And you see that a lot, obviously, with Mussolini. Um, the emphasis on fashion, the emphasis of being one of the people, and also the uh, emphasis on his physicality and the, the way he is shot, also a lot of in close up and uh, from the chest up, yeah. right? Again, emphasizing power and strength. Can we say something? I think we should then open up to questions and discussion, but about the, the, the whitening of Machiste, because Isn't as you right? pointed out at the beginning in, in Kabiria, he's a black slave. He, he blacks up in this film when he's playing the servant. Um, and then he, you know, in fact, ends the film in that disguise, doesn't he? Is that right? I think. Or no, he no, washes no. it no, off. He washes it off. Yeah, right. You does. have to see him. You know, it's yeah. very important yeah. that you see he, the character put on the makeup and take it off, take it off. Yeah. because it's reinforcing the fact that he's now white. Yeah. yeah. Right. That's the whole point but of that. Is what do you read ar around that? The whole thing about the kind of whitening of Machista. What's going on there? Do you think, in terms of the way this character signifies something for the nation? Well, I think that when he was an African slave, you know, he was a good hero, and sometimes he would actually appear in black makeup in public opinions, uh, in public appearances. But what's um, what I think is important is that for a national hero, Machiste had to be white. He couldn't be an African slave. He had to be a contemporary white member of of society, and he also had to be, I think, you know, positioned in the north, in Turin, uh, as opposed to in the south. Um, in terms of aligned with a kind of modern version of Italy. Like if you notice in this film, you see lots of modes of transportation, modern modes of transportation, right? You see trains, you see cars, right? Mixed in with horse carriages, right? It's really awesome. Um, and, but it's very, Machiste was also a very modern figure, even though he was used, you know, sort of basic feats of strength and bravery, which have ties to kind of classical representations of the male body. He was incredibly modern, right? He dressed well. He he um, was a member of the bourgeoisie, clearly. He was, he was an actor. He was in the most modern of medium, right, of film, because he plays an actor. Oh, I should note that almost every Machiste film begins with him filming a scene from his latest movie. So in Machiste Alpino, he's up in Austria filming yeah. a scene, and that's how he gets involved yeah. in with wartime crew, Italy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and in... Um, Oh, what's another good one? In oh yeah, Machiste on vacation, right? There's a film called Machiste in Vacanza. I kid you not, it's really fantastic. You know, he's had enough. He's working so hard, he has to go on vacation, and he he orders this car, right? It's a Diato car, and it only has room for one passenger, right? Because he's so fed up of everybody following him, and he keeps referring to the car as his wife. So there's lots of sort of ties between um, Machiste. Modernity, also futurism, the whole alliance of man and the machine and muscles uh, and, uh, and sort of in contemporary Italy. So he yeah. kind of becomes this very mo classical but also modern yeah. male hero. And I think what's interesting is in your narrative in the book, you, you, you fit this into a longer history where Italy since unification, so since 1861, has been in search of a, a national identity. Uh, there are various versions that are offered. It's going to be, you know, this progressive liberal state and, you know, a modernizing country. But what you're suggesting is really around 1915 and then with the rise of fascism, that national identity crystallizes in the figure of the strong man. And then it produces the Duce. So could you maybe just elaborate that, that longer history a bit? Well, you did it so well. Oh, I don't no. know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just taking it from your book. <laughs> um, you know, gosh, I don't know what else I could add. Uh, that I, I think that what happens um, is that he's this very appealing and pleasing package. He appeals to everybody, mm. and so it's not just a sort of a sort of nationalist hero. It's a populist hero. We've been talking a lot about populism in the United States these yeah. days. Um, one thing is right in fascism. <laughs> but one thing that's very important is that um, Machiste is always tied to the status quo. He's never um, reactionary. Uh, 
Um, he always, like in the strikes, he sides with, he doesn't side with the workers. He, he, he actually, he sides with the industrialists, but not the managerial class. He gets very anti-bourgeois. Um, in, uh, in terms of, he's always about restoring people to their rightful rule. Um, incidentally, this is one of the few films in which Machiste has a love interest. Um, the other one, of course, is Machiste Innamorato, means Machiste in love. And uh, it ends badly. Sorry, spoiler alert. <laughs> and the, so he's very much tied to um, a kind of man uh, who lives for, who serves others, who you know, restores rightful rule. Um, in a couple of films, he is, you know, he does take a leadership position, but it's always sort of as a backseat to those um, in power. Okay. And just one more question, I think we will open up, but you, since you've also worked on this long history of the diva, with the book you've done with Catherine O'Rourke, and you go from Bartolomeo Pagano <laughs> to, as I said, to Scamarcio, how do, you, how do you see that long trajectory? And what happens to masculinity in the cinema uh, in that period of like 100, 100 years since 1915? A lot. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> but, the short, but the short version. The short version is that um, I think that one of the things that's really important to understand in terms of cinema, in particular in Italian cinema, is that it doesn't exist in isolation, but that it engages constantly with a rapidly changing economic, political, social, sexual landscape. And uh, in the, you, it, so during the, during silent period, you have these very sort of strong, kind of, you have a lot of these strong men. Uh, during the fascist period, some of that continues, but you also have other kind of images, such as the sort of boy next door, um, right, the bravo ragazzo, a mantle that, you know, Mastriani picks up later. You have the politically committed actor, someone like Gianmaria Volonté picks that up. Yeah. Uh, you have the comic, the long tradition of the comic in Italy, which starts during the fashion, during the silent period with Cretinetti, mm -hmm. uh, Tontolini. I mean, there's tons of these, these, these comic films that Machiste, also, the Machiste films also draw, and many of them, the Cretinetti films were produced by Itala, okay. right? Very, yeah. you know, very yeah. uh, popular. And so you have um, these kinds of ways in which these characters interact with what's going on around them, and they don't exist in isolation. And I think that's a really important distinction to make between sort of male uh, stars in Italy versus female stars. Female stars, especially in the beginning, we're always seeing as kind of otherworldly, you know, more beautiful, more heavenly, more godly, um, while male stars were always tied to the everyday, yeah. right? They were of this earth yeah, yeah. rather than divine. Mm, that's very interesting. Yeah, great. Okay, thanks very much. Let's sure. throw open some questions. Questions for, for Jackie, not for me. This particular film is 1915? Correct, yes. By 1915, uh, Griffith ha had already become <coughs> influenced by Kabiria and other films for their scope and their length. But Griffith had already uh, uh, created the whole modern vocabulary of cinema. There's not a single camera movement or moving camera or, or cut within a scene in this film, so the, uh, these were like, uh, you say these films were uh, popular over here. Uh, they were very old fashioned by Griffith's standards. Um, uh, at, at, what, at what point did they start catching up or? Uh, they kind of didn't. Right, that they that Italian cinema, in terms of technology, right, in terms of um, technical capacity, like editing, lighting, um, camera movement, all those things you say, are uh, remain very much behind in terms of Griffith. They sort of stayed stuck in the past. Um, the reference here also is that Griffith. Um, saw Cabiria was very influenced by the sets, and so many of the sets on Intolerance were based on uh, Cabiria. Italians were the first to start really with the sort of feature length long film, right? They had Last Days of Pompeii, Quo Vadis, um, and others, uh, and so 
they, it, this was the considered sort of 1909, 1908 to 1914 is really considered the golden age of Italian cinema, or the first golden age, depending on who you ask. Uh, and the, um, but in terms of their, uh, let's say, sort of technical capabilities, they remained very backwards. And that was one of the reasons why, in about 1919, the cinema, pretty much at, right after World War I, the cinema as an institution and an industry in Italy started to collapse. So where you were having hundreds and hundreds of films produced um, uh, by in 1919, by 1926, you had a total of, I think, 30 films produced the entire year in Italy. And four of those films were machiste films, interestingly enough. Um, but in terms of machiste's influence on American cinema, it was very strong in terms of the serials, right? If you think of, um, bless you, if you think about the serial films like uh, The Perils of Pauline, The Exploits of Elaine, right? All of those films came over to uh, Italy, influenced the Machiste series, right? We didn't have really, you had one female here and you had female strong woman, but that wasn't until like 1919, 1920. Her name was Astrea. Uh, but you had these films and then when the Machiste films came over to the United States, um, he was really one of the first kind of strong men uh, whose serials were popular here. So much so that when Elma Lincoln uh, who played the mighty man of valor in Intolerance and was the first Tarzan in the serial version of Tarzan, um, when he started in his own series called Elmo the Mighty, um, one newspaper billed him, oh, Elmo is strong, almost, and he is known as the Yankee Machiste, right? So it was using this very well-known phrase for this actor um, who would then go on to star in his own serials. So Machista is kind of this transitional figure there. I should also say that a lot of people believe that uh, Valentino was the first Italian actor whose film, you know, to be popular in the United States. It was really Pagano was mm -hmm. the first Italian actor to gain a kind of popularity, even though he didn't make any films here. Um, they did make a film, they did make a serial called The Liberator, sadly this is lost, which was a compilation of, of different machiste films. They would often take old ones, and some three of which are, are, are lost. We haven't been able to find The Liberator anywhere. Mm. I, Stefano. I have to uh, yeah. <laughs> I, it's a brilliant presentation, first of all, and thank you very much. Um, I found very interesting the, the issue of the black makeup and Matista going from a black slave as a very marginal character in Kabiri on some level. He's the servant of the co-protagonist, if even. And, but his popularity became so big that it causes the phenomenon. And I found it very interesting that this change of race happens in Torino that, as some people know, was the city chosen by the American government to decide whether you were Italian white or Italian non-white. Below the peril that runs through Turin, you were classified as Italian non-white, and above as Italian white. It was a racially relevant classification for the immigration authorities of the US. It's, there is a book by Jennifer Guglielmo called Are Italians White, in which they talk about this whole thing. So it's very symbolic that in Turin, these uh, race switch takes place in such a visual and, and tangible uh, mm. manner. And then as a disclaimer since at the beginning, uh, I mentioned the my sister films that I was basically forced to watch as a kid, they belong to the second reincarnation of Machiste that is not actually part of your book, obviously, the one in the 60s and even arrives to the 70s to include Machiste Avenger of the Mayans. And, uh, so it, and how about Total Control? Total Control Machiste. <laughs> and so that is a second wave of, of, of machista that it's a further testimony to the Which comes in after of course the Roman epic, the, the muscle yes, the, the muscle films of the fifties. Exactly you know, with Hercules and stuff. Peplum yeah. movies and, and all that. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, in the front. Just a comment on the reflection of time. The reference to psychiatry, I oh, think yeah. Freud was becoming, you know, he was becoming more and more popular then. These guys were like Shirts with, with 
don't know where that that was really common in the era. All right, a lot of films, very few films, uh, were actually set in Italy, right? right? Made They were all sort of set in these foreign, exotic lands that were never quite specified. But in terms of psychiatry, it's very interesting because Turin had the first professorship of psychiatry in all of Italy. Mm. So that, it, it, and it's a very, that Dr. Krauss is a pretty interesting character, isn't he's he? He's like Dr. Caligari. Right, he's yeah. a, lo a little bit, pre prefigures Caligari, but I think it's more of an, a kind of anti-psychiatric discourse, right? He's called an alienist. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we can even sort of, you know, venture into a kind of anti-Semitic sort of discourse as well in terms of his iconography and the representation um, of the sort of typical, sort of stereotypical Jew, right? Remember also Cesare Lombroso was from Turin, mm -hmm. right? You have a lot of sort of, sort of nefarious kind of psychology going on. Incidentally, for a while, I thought that, um, that Pagano, Bartolomeo Pagano was born in Naples. There had been, there was a court document that specified that he had been born in Naples. And then, and so this became a big issue of, for us, for, for the people at the museum and, and myself was where was, Machi, where was Pagano born, right? And um, we actually went to Genova to get his death certificate because the death certificate tells you also the place of birth and it was in fact Genova. So he was born and um, he died in Genova in the Villa Machiste, which still exists. You can still go visit the Villa Machiste. One thing I also want to say, if you noticed, I keep making the mistake of referring to Pagano as Machiste. I mean, one of the things that's really fascinating is that you begin to see a total collapse of character and actor. So much so that when you get to when you look at the correspondence between uh, that's related to the productions that's archived at the National Film Museum, you find references to Pagano in which he's refer referenced as machiste, right? So you'll see a telegram saying, "Well, we had to stop production, and you know, and Pag but Pagano wanted to go home to Genoa for a few days, and it says, you know, production stop, machiste." I went home for a few days. You know, they refer to him as Machiste in the actual internal correspondence. This is what's so interesting about, as I was saying at the beginning, when you work on stardom, you're always working on this kind of interface between the movie text and the world outside it. And he's such an interesting case of how there's that, you know, the, the, the Pagano becomes Machiste outside the films. Right. But I think you mentioned that in the legal case, when he wants to go and work in Germany and Italy are trying to sort of say, you know, he can't go and work there. Yeah. Um, the court rules that actually Machiste can only be Pagano. Is right. that right? right. You know, against there was against uh, Italo's claim, anybody can play Machiste. We'll just find another actor. Right. They kind of rule in Pagano's favor. He's so identified that he is right. Machiste. Right. That there is actually right legal, you know, precedence that yeah, he's, yeah. you know, that he's the, the fusion between character um, and actor. No, it, and he did make two other non-Machiste, no, sorry, three other non-Machiste movies um, after, uh, in 28 and 29, and, and then he stopped working. He had very terrible arthritis, um, crippling arthritis. Mm -hmm. So he um, had, uh, so he stopped working. And they actually asked him in 1944 to come back and make another Machiste. I mean, he was, you know, pretty old by that time. Mm -hmm. um, and he died pretty soon right after that. Yeah. Yeah, so I think we should probably wrap up in a minute. Yeah, so one more question, and then. No, that was it. it. Sound didn't come to Italy until 1930, 31. Yeah. So he was. Yeah. Nicola. Yeah. Sorry. It's a modern score. Yeah. 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 Right. But this is this is the this is something my students do all the time, right? They say, Well, I felt the music really enhanced you know, when we watch silent films, I say, Well, I felt the music really enhanced the emotions and they said, Yes, you know, but it's not the original music. Uh, we don't know what the original music was like. We do know what the original music was like for Kabiria because we have a score. Um, it's one of the few instances. The other ones are Charlie Chaplin films. You know, Chaplin wrote a lot of his music. So, like, he wrote mm. for the kid and, and others, so you can yeah. get an example of that. I think there's... But there was a score, but there was a score originally, or it was open to different possibilities in the... There was no score for this, for this particular film. But there was a score for Cabiria. Yeah. Right. 
Well, it was because it was a stage with a full orchestra, and yeah, yeah, it was right. actually a bit of a huge kind of spectacle, Cabiria, yeah. There's... Yes. 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 Right. Um, I think it's the idea that that's, this is his new calling card, and it's kind of like, okay, I'm a cheese day, and now I'm going to star in all these films, right? And it's kind of like, you know, it's a, it's a teaser in a certain way. I also just want to say that Machiste del Pino was, just to go back, the next one, well, actually, yeah, it's the next one he made as Machiste. He made another short film in which he, he doesn't play Machiste. Um, uh, was actually screened for Italian soldiers going off to the war as a kind of manual of how they should behave. <laughs> yeah, I found proof of that. Was when I found that one, I was really excited. Yeah. Proof of that. Right. Uh, Sorry, I was curious, does the name Machiste have any in Italian? Yes, it does. That's a great question. Okay, so there's a, there's a whole big thing about who made up the name of Machiste, right? And um, it is a creation of Gabriele D'Annunzio. D'Annunzio wrote the um, t intertitles for Cabiria. And uh, it, there's a very famous um, quote uh, by Pastrone where he says, the director of Cabiria says, D'Annunzio came up with the name of um, Machiste, I made him black. He says, I, actually, he calls I made him a mulatto, is what he says. Mm. And uh, the, um, uh, and so, but it has connotations from um, machino, right, which means large rock. And if the first appearance of Machiste in Cabiria is, in fact, um, uh, among the rocks on, on, the, on the seashore. It now has its own meaning. Machiste, right? You could say someone in Italian, someone a un vero machiste means he's a big, strong guy. Um, you can buy machiste beer. Uh, you can buy machiste muscle powder, <laughs> protein powder. <laughs> I kid you not. You can buy. Ma Rob Rushing sent me a link for machiste protein powder. Um, so it it still has that kind of connotation. I think there was one. Yeah. But it has nothing to do with machista. Macho, no, no, no not no, at no, all. No, no, no. Different. That's Spanish. Right. Yes. Yeah, the only observation I wanted to make was that the people who are film buffs, you know, and I've seen that Bruce Lee and Jackie Chan and, you know, all of these films where one martial artist handles 28 uh, people rushing at him, or Uma Thurman. Right. Oh, yeah, Kill Bill, right. Um, we were talking about it, that. It, 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 you, my first reaction was a little dismissive. Oh, he only took care of five guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it gets more in the later films. The strength, the, the physical strength of him having to climb above that door, yeah. you know, that was real. I mean, that was Mm -hmm. That makes it easy for one person to to uh, to handle twenty or twenty five. Right. I mean, these were all very highly choreographed scenes as well, right? You know, we're not gonna let's not uh, uh, you know give him so much, you know. But he did do all his own stunts, and uh, he was very um, uh, you know he gets a little pudgy at the end of the series, a little flabby. If you've ever watched. Right, if you ever watch Machiste in Inferno, Machiste in Hell from 1926, yeah, he's a little tubby then. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but he, yeah, and in fact, in, some, in the case in, against him by Itala, they're saying, you know, he's fat yeah, and overweight. He's, seed, he's yeah. you know, he's gone to seed <laughs> and everything, yeah. It's, it, one of the things that I, I do want to say about um, using the sources, it was really amazing because I got to, um, use a lot of contemporary sources that are housed in the archives of the National Film Museum. And um, there's really just a tre treasure trove of information that you can actually go and explore online. And you could see it. If you go to the uh, Museo Nazionale del Cinema uh, website, and you just 
type it in and they have um, online, they have their online resources and they placed all of the archival documents related to Machiste online. There's also a lovely um, uh, sort of sezione in Machiste that they did that I have links to it in the book um, where you can click on um, a particular scene and you'll see a scene from the film and you'll see some of the, document, the documents associated with it. It's very nicely done. Great. I, I think we're going to have to stop because we run, we run out of time. But thank you for the questions. Can I just thank Jackie so much? In my enthusiasm to talk about her work at the beginning, I forgot to mention her job, which is she's professor and chair <laughs> of the Department of Communication and Media Studies at Fordham University. Pretty important. But, you know, uh, and her book is, I think, still on yeah, sale it's up upstairs. On, on sale upstairs. So buy it. It's great. And I'm going to order the Machista Muscle Powder on Amazon now. <laughs> thank you, David.